It's our delight again today to be sharing our heart with you and bringing to you something that I trust in the grace of God will be uh, a blessing to you. I have given thought throughout the years of ministry, 40 years of ministry now, and I shudder when I think of the length of that time, but I've given thought to things that really matter. I um, have tried to go back through my experience and look at those times when I gained enormously and other times when I failed and, and identify uh, in both the failures and the successes the things that God does to bring some sort of equilibrium to our life and wholeness. I want to speak to you today on the subject of keys that actualize the anointing. I'm going to choose the life of David for us to look at, and I want to preface what I'm about to read to you with uh, perhaps a little story that will help you catch the essence or sense in which I want to convey this truth. I was, uh, some years ago, pastoring at the Fountain Gate in Dallas, Texas, and enjoying our ministry enormously. I happened to be very blind, and uh, I also happened to be very lame. Um, the results of a plane crash in the Marshall Islands and an effort to constantly uh, uh, try to walk and improve, uh, but hanging on to the vestige of vision that I had, and that was so incredibly poor that I could hardly see anything. I was trained by California with a blind cane and then prioritized on the guide dogs for the blind program in San Rafael, California. The um, uniqueness uh, of that event found me one morning praying in the main auditorium of the church that I was pastoring. I knew uh, that God was speaking to my heart about turning the church over to one of the pastors that we'd made the effort to disciple. And when I say disciple, these were very keen individuals who did not need my uh, personal uh, efforts to try to make them pastors. They were all lovely people and very strong men and women. I had spent every Tuesday with them in a discipling process with all of us just looking at things that, that really mattered to the church. Um, when I found myself praying, I crawled under the piano, and I'll be honest with you why. I, uh, I found that when I kneel at the altar in that church and a long distance phone call comes in, my secretaries would inadvertently come in, tap me on the shoulder, and say, uh, Pastor, you've got a long distance call. And I'd be in prayer, and I'd have to get up and go to the telephone. <coughs> I found <coughs> that if I crawled under the piano and prayed under the piano, no secretary would crawl under there to get me. And I found, <laughs> I found a consolation in praying under the piano. And so whether that sounds good or not, that became my place to pray. Uh, I was praying one day and saying, God, I, I want to follow you. I want to obey, but I am a, um, I'm in my 50s, and Lord Jesus, I, I'm blind, I'm lame. I don't know how I could get up and become active again as a traveling ministry. And God very distinctly spoke to my spirit and said, uh, Son, I'm not looking for a pair of good eyes or a pair of good feet. I'm looking for one relatively decent heart. If you want to get up and obey me, I will, uh, I will lead you and I'll show you things that will boggle your mind. Well, I was carried away with that and delighted with it, obviously. Got back to my feet and took my blind cane and tapped my way back into my office. Immediately, one of my secretaries came in and said, uh, Dr. Sasser, the uh, second grade class from the academy, our school, uh, came down with their teacher and wanted to pray for you for your blindness and we told them that you have an impacted day. You have an absolutely radical day of counseling. So we sent them back to their class. And I want to just lay on your, your desk the schedule that you have in counseling today. I uh, picked the schedule up and set it aside and asked my secretary to sit down. And I said, honey, let me, let me just converse with you for a moment. We talked about the fact that the second grade class 
was not tomorrow's church, it was today's church. And that before I saw any saint with any kind of a problem, I wanted to see the second grade class again in my office. And yes, we would go ahead with their prayer meeting, and when they were through, I would get back to the problem of the saints. When I, uh, when I man managed to convey that, and it was clear, my secretaries, who were lovely women, rushed off down the hallway to get the second grade class and bring them back. Uh, I had one of these sudden urges that life has for us, saints, and uh, got my blind cane and tapped my way off down the hallways to the men's restroom. And I want you to hold with me. This is common for all of us. But I entered the, the men's restroom and opened one of the stall doors. This is a beautiful restroom at the Fountain Gate. It was uh, floor tiles that were polished like glass. And I, I went into that uh, little stall and I sat down and right behind me into that restroom came three little second grade boys. They tried to reach me before I got in the stall and I heard them whispering outside the stall. They said, um, Pastor Sam's on the potty. I was a little uncomfortable with that, but these were second grade guys and I loved them with all my heart as a pastor. Um, I could hear them whispering about what I knew not, and all of a sudden, one of them, Jimmy, laid down on the floor, put his hands on my stall door, and zzz, on his back, slipped right into my stall, laying there on his back. And I looked down, and I said, Jimmy, how are you? And he said, Pastor, I'm fine. I think he thought he needed to get educational very quickly. And so all of a, a sudden, um, he... Um, he, he looked up at me and he said, Pastor Sam, um, how many planets in the constellation? And I looked at him cross-eyed like, well, son, isn't there a better time to talk about this? I said, honey, there, there, there are nine planets in the constellation. Well, he said, sir, I've got one more question for you. And I said, what is it, son? He said, what are the two moons around Mars? And I thought to myself, sweet Jesus, two moons around Mars, this kid's a second grader. What, what in the world are his teachers teaching him? I said, Jimmy, the two moons around Mars are Deimos and Phobos. He said, oh, Pastor, I can't tell you nothing. I said, no, honey, that's not it. I, I went to school one day, too. I said, Jimmy, I've got a question for you. He said, sir, I said, can, hon, can we finish this conversation in just a minute? He said, yes, sir, and zzz, out he went. Well, I, I finished the things that had taken me into that stall in the first place, and opened the door and stepped out. And when I looked here to my rather blinded vision were the shadowy little outlines of 12 second grade boys that had now come into the men's restroom and were all seated on the floor waiting for me to get out of that, that stall. I sat down on the floor with them and said, how are you guys doing? They said, incredible. I said, what do you want? They said, Pastor, we, we got a major question. I said, well, guys, what is it? They said, brother, you've got to promise us first that you'll, that you'll do it. And I said, guys, you know I can't do that. Uh, you made me promise last month, and I got you and the teachers and myself in trouble. I said, come on, tell me what it is first. And they said, no, we, we can't tell you. You've you got to promise. And the teachers told us that you're going to be leaving in two weeks. Man, you've got to promise us. I said, okay, what is it? They said, we want to see your glass eye. I had, uh, through a plane crash, uh, limited my vision previous to the blindness I now possess to very limited vision, my right eye, and my left eye was already glass. Uh, the results of a plane crash and a major fight that, uh, where a man just absolutely beat the tar out of me in, in the Marshall Islands. But uh, I... Uh, I laughed and I said, okay. I reached up and took my glass eye out and handed it to them and they passed it around and said, ooh, get a load of that thing. Out of sight. Uh, I uh, sat there and then they said, uh, we want to see the hole. So I, I took my eye and I flared it open and said, well, get up here, you guys, and look into the hole. And they did so just ooing and eyeing. And Jimmy, with my eye still in his hands, a little guy that had crawled underneath the stall door jumped up and ran for the bathroom door and ran out in the hallway and I could hear him 
chasing all the little second grade girls down the hallway with my eye, I knew that I was in trouble again. I went to the door and shouted, Jimmy, bring my eye back. I've got counseling today. He brought my eye back. I washed it off, put it in there, and all of them agreed that the eye was not cockeyed. It looked good. And I took my blind cane and tapped my way back down to my office and sat at my desk. And in just a few minutes, here came the whole second grade class with their teacher. Boys giving me the thumbs up. They knew something the girls didn't know. They'd looked into that open place in my head where the eye fit. I, uh, I sit there at my desk in Marvel. They circled my desk in my chair and held hands. And the teacher said, we want to pray for your eyes. I said, I welcome that. And I welcome this prayer meeting. And I, in turn, turned and hugged all the kids and then let them get back in their circle. And they began to pray, and their praying was astute. I mean, these were kids that, that knew what they were doing. They prayed all the way around the circle for my eye and got right down to the end of the line, and Jimmy was the, the last boy in the line. This was during the um, desert storm battle over in, in uh, Iraq and, and, uh, and Kuwait. And Jimmy, as he was praying, said, God, we want you to heal, Pastor Sam. God, give him a light back in that good eye. And Father, don't let him die in the war. And I listened to that and said, this kid is prophetic. Uh, I had no intention of going to war, I will assure you. But I had other battles that I was fighting. When that young group of students left my office, I sat at my desk and I said to God, God, why is it? that there are so many incredibly dull adults in today's church and so many fabulous kids. Now, please, that may be from a weary pastor on that occasion, but that, those were my emotions. And God answered my query. He said to me, you really want to know? This was a reasoning in my spirit. I said, yes, Lord, I do. And he said, son, it's because children have never lost their sense of wonder. I've never had an adult ask me to see my glass eye. Children tend to tread where angels fear to tread. Open it up. We want to see the whole. <laughs> I, I've never had anybody ask me that in my life. But a child knows no fear. There's a lot of wonder there. When I went back to my studies at my desk, I thought of David, the young shepherd boy. I thought of the uniqueness of his life. He was a kid filled with wonder. You'll remember when Samuel, the prophet and judge of Israel, came to Jesse's home, David's father, and inquired concerning his sons because he felt keenly that one of those sons was to be the king of Israel. Samuel waltzed seven boys before him. None of them did a thing for Samuel's spirit. And he inquired again, do you not have yet another? And he said, well, the runt is out watching the sheep. He said, well, then get the runt in here. And David was brought before Samuel the prophet. Samuel's spirit exploded. He laid hands on David, and out came the horn of anointing oil. He poured the anointing oil over David and announced that David would be king of Israel. Now, that's big-time news for a, a kid that's in his early teens. And it would be years before that would be actualized, and that is precisely what we are after in this message, actualizing the anointing. It can be given to your life. The Word tells us and promises us steadily that the anointing that we have abides within us. But for many of us, it takes an age to actualize that anointing until we are in a position where gently and quietly and faithfully we are able to use that anointing to our gain and the gain of those whom God has graciously allowed us to work with. David accepts the word of Samuel 
to move from his father's home to the courts at Teresa with King Saul. In this way, he hopes that David will learn courtly posture and gesture, that he will learn the ways of a king in the court. He loves Jonathan, Saul's son, and loves Saul as well. But Saul was a jealous man. He had a whole lot of administrative ability, but very little else going for him, and he was not God's choice. You'll remember the story, how that Saul appoints David as a general in the armies of Israel. The kid isn't even old enough to be a general. He's in his early 20s, and he has served court time now for a number of years. But David marches off with the armies of Israel and in a pitched conflict against the Philistines where Israel was far outnumbered, David takes an incredible victory. And in marching home, the maidens of Israel are dancing in the streets with their tambourines and singing, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. Saul did not care for the song a whole lot and was very jealous. He continued to promote David all the way up to head javelin catcher of the Israeli Olympic team, and David had to turn and run for his life. The story for several chapters in 2 Samuel tells us of David's fleeing. He runs to hide with the Philistines, and when the Philistines house his mother and father, but are plotting his overthrow and death because they hated David. David feigns madness, wipes spittle on his beard, and finally escapes the Philistines, runs away into the land of Nob, going further into the wilderness. There the priests help him, feed him shoe bread and strengthen him. David hides. Saul sends his posse after David. And the scripture tells us that that group of constabulary literally kill all the priests in, in, in the land of Nob. Abimelech tries to help David. And David turns then and flees on out even further into a little place called the Shifla, the fifth valley of the Shifla in southern Judah, which was um, the Valley of Adullam, about eight miles wide, and, and a valley that housed a thousand caves, and it became the hiding place for David, and brings us immediately to the narrative now that I want to speak from. Note with me in 1 Samuel chapter 22, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam. This really in the Hebrew is in the plural, to the caves of Adullam. And when his brethren in his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And every one that was in distress, and every one that was in debt, and every one that was discontented, <laughs> that sounds like every church that I have ever, ever pastored, everyone in debt, everyone in distress, everyone discontented, gathered themselves unto him. And the scripture adds uh, that he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. May I observe something in these two verses first, and then we'll continue. David, in fleeing to the wilderness, immediately as a magnet draws others hiding in the wilderness to him. These in-debt, distressed, discontented men are men fleeing the law. They hide. They hear that David is in the caves of Adullam. And so immediately they turn and they go to the caves of Adullam and, and join themselves to David, 400 very disconcerted uh, men. And yet when we see this, we're not aware of the fact that this same crowd of men is shared with us over in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, and I of necessity must read that to you because it is an incredible change in an 18-month period. 
What I am saying is that in 18 months' time, the in debt, distressed, and discontented become a crowd of warriors that number in the tens of thousands. And the portrait of them is hardly one of, of being in debt or being uh, uh, in depression. I want you to listen to me as I read once again this account uh, of these men 18 months later. Now look very carefully with me in the book of First Chronicles chapter 12. And these are they that came to David to Ziklag while he yet hid himself close because of Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the in debt, the distressed, and the discontented. Uh-uh, uh-uh. It doesn't say that. They were among the mighty men, helpers of the war. They were armed with bows and could use both the right hand and the left in hurling stones to conserve time. Let me read scatteredly through this chapter, and I will call the verse in the position. Verse 8 adds this, two lines in. Uh, it says that they were men of might and men of war, fit for the battle, that they could handle shield and buckler, whose faces were like the faces of lions, and were as swift as the rows upon the mountains. Go with me quickly, please, over to verse 21 of this same chapter, uh, chapter 12 of the book of Second Chronicles, no, our first Chronicles. Note with me, please, 21. And they helped David uh, uh, against the hand uh, uh, of, um, of the rovers, for they were all mighty men of valor, and were captains in the host. Look at verse 22, please, with me. For at that time, day by day, there came to David to help him until it was a great host like the host of God. Let me read again, verse 23, two lines into the verse. It adds for our edification that they were ready, armed for the war, and came to David to Hebron to turn the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. Ah, bear with me. Verse 25, one line in. They were mighty men of valor. Look with me again, please, in verse 32, one line in. Men that had understandings of the time to know what Israel ought to do. Again, in verse 20, or 33, the last two lines. They could keep rank. They were not of a double heart. And let me conclude this reading with verse 38, please. All these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest also of Israel were of one heart to make David king. That, my friends, is an incredible story. Anytime you can take 400 in debt, in, de in distress, and discontented men, and in 18 months' time, teach them to march in rank and file, to, to have, as it were, the faces of lions, to march with ambidextrousness and ability to war with either hand, you've got a major change, and I want to look into that change. How in the world can such a fantastic change take place in such a relatively short period of time? We're not left in the dark. David, as he ministers very, very faithfully at the caves of Adullam, wrote four songs. I want to share with you those four songs in the Psalms. Obviously, in this setting, it would be impossible to really deal with all four psalms. But I want to give you the first of the four psalms David wrote at the cave of Adullam. It is Psalms 34, and it houses the four keys that actualize the anointing of God to move both David and his men who were in depression to a place of victory and a place of gainsaying the anointing of God that was given to them. Psalms 34 houses those keys. Listen carefully as, once again, 
I read from that chapter, chapter 34 of the book of Psalms. Verses 1, 2, and 3 give us the first key to actualizing the anointing. Listen carefully. David says, at the cave of Adullam, a song written when he fled Abimelech and sung with all of his men, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble, that is the in debt, distressed, discontented, those of relatively no account, the humble, those of poor stead, shall hear thereof and be glad. Then he gives the, the, the plural call, O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. The first key to actualizing the anointing of God is the key of praise. It's certainly not anything new to this age. Thousands of churches have come alive in their ministry to the Lord. But, beloved, listen to me. The key of praise is one of the most credible ways to actualize the anointing of God in your life. I honestly believe to this very day that there is music in the heart of God that He has not yet given the church because we would not know what to do with it if we had it. It's difficult enough for us to know how to mount an anointing level with the music that we have, with the dynamism of praise, with those times when God releases our spirit in warfare in worship, and we stand in the dynamism of, of really giving all that is in our heart to God. I love to worship the Lord. I, I love to praise His name. But I want to share with you something. Praise is not something that is finished or has been amplified to its full because we have experienced some dynamic single service. It is a growing uh, quality in our life to be able to express our heart to God and say, Lord Jesus, I love you, and behind that phrase, I love you, put all of the fullness of our spirit to be released into praise and eventually drawn by the same God of praise into an even keener perspective of worship is not something that happens overnight. It takes a great deal of love and expression and effort. It doesn't just enjoin itself to banners and tambourines. You can know the art of worship and miss the heart of worship. It is a heart that is bowed and prostrated, proscuneo, that bows in the presence of the king and kisses his feet, if you please. It is one that delights to honor him. David said the first key to actualizing the anointing, gentlemen, to those of you here at the caves of Adullam, is to magnify the Lord with me. What an incredible thought. What an absolutely incredible thought. I uh, was over in Yap in the central uh, Caroline Islands in the interior jungles of Yap, and I had sought permission from, uh, from Chief Depoy a tribal leader, to minister to his people on a number of occasions, I think five or six occasions that week, and had been turned down every single time. He did not want me to preach. Through the course of the week, I heard that uh, on Friday, or Saturday rather, of that week, that they were going to be receiving new young men into, uh, into maturation levels. By that I mean you had to reach a certain age and then qualify to be an adult member in the Yappy society. I uh, took great interest in that and uh, with that interest began to, uh, to seek permission to join that group of young men and subsequently qualify for that culture in that society. It was a crazy thought, but I carried it through. The men in the town council laughed at me and yet at the same time uh, thought well of the idea and said, yes, we're going to let you try. We'll let you enter the competition. 
I, uh, I looked at that and said, God, I, I want that so much. I, um, I can remember going with about 30 young men into about an 11-acre clearing. 2,000 men circled the, the clearing. And for three days and three nights, we entered into various Yappies games that would prove our manhood. Uh, the first night, I had to wrestle with two men. And they body slammed me all over that 11 acres. I thought, God, there's got to be a better way to make a living. <laughs> uh, this missionary stuff will kill you if you stay at it. I, um, I know that uh, I was rather poor in many of their games, climbing coconut trees and harvesting coconuts. I, I'm not sure that I'd reach the top when they, when they were through. Uh, there were games of races. There were incredible uh, multitude of different types of things that we had to go through. And, uh, and I went through all of these things. When we were through, I went back uh, and joined the circle of those 2,000 men. And shuffling our feet, we danced in a large circle. Now, you bear with me, please. I'd learn to stand on my head if that's what it took to preach the gospel to people in re very remote areas. When we were through, we sat down together. And Chief Depoy turned to me and said, I'm going to let you preach tonight. I thought, praise God, if I've got the strength left, I'll sure try. I hadn't been asleep for three nights. Um, he, um, he turned to me and said, but before you preach, I'm going to prove to you that our gods are stronger than your God Jehovah ever thought of being. I looked at him and said, okay. He sat there for a moment, and then he began to clap his hands. As he did so, all 2,000 of those men in that circle began to clap their hands with him. And then he lifted his voice, and he began to chant. And all 2,000 of those men began to chant, and their chanting was not alike at all. It was somewhat like the Hebrew Tehillah, the residual song of the Spirit that is sung in so many churches today, Hallelujah, blessed be your name, we rejoice in you, Lord. That, that little song of your spirit that you sing, it's called Ode Pneumatica in the New Testament. The odes of the spirit. Uh, be filled with the spirit, singing to yourself in psalmos and umneos and Ode Pneumatica, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Uh, that free-flowing of our spirit hell picks up and copies even in the areas of darkness and these men clapping their hands uh, continued to sing from the residue of their spirit and uh, and rejoice i say rejoice in what they knew to be life-giving to them though it was death in entirely uh, as they sang and they clapped there were two grass houses down at the end of that uh, of that circle of 2,000 men. And out of one of those grass houses came two Yappies women. The Yappies, both male and female, only wear a little thew around their waist as covering. Those two ladies moved out, one young lady, one older lady, into the center of that circle, and with their hands raised in what we would recognize as a worship mode, began to just gently gyrate and dance and, and in the presence of those men, as they sang and clapped their hands. Chief Dupoy looked at me and lifted an eyebrow like, I want you to get a hold of this. Watch this carefully. While those two women danced, God is my witness, both of them rose about 10 feet in the air and continued dancing. Uh, man, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. The poet turned to me and said, what do you think about that? I said, that's, that's pretty good. That's hot. I sat there, and he said, well, what can your God do? Now, please allow me to be human. I, I sat there and said, God, what, what in the world can you do? Uh, I said, Depoy, uh, he said, no, let me tell you what you should do to prove your God to me. You join them in the air. I said, no, Depoy, that isn't God's will. Well, he said, what can your God do? I said, God can bring them both down. Well, he said, not till I give the word. I thought, Shh, uh, 
But immediately he turned to me and said, okay, I give the word. You bring them both down. I rose and walked out into the clearing. And I stood there, not with braggadocio. I did not rebuke anything or shout, glory to God. I simply stood there and said, Lord Jesus, I really need your help. I lifted my hands and I began to sing. Hallelujah to the Lord God of Israel. I bless your wondrous name. I praise you this day, Lord. Really, you know, when I'm sitting here singing that way, it sounds so beautiful. It was more like, I bless your precious name. Glory to God. I, th there was a lot of trepidation in it, a lot of worry. And yet within 20 seconds of my singing praise, both of those women fell and hit the ground. The younger of the two injured herself. We prayed for her, and by very, every observation, God had touched her. And yet it's a, it's a stigma today to think back and know that even in that release, uh, there were no major revival or converts among the Yappies people. I think a man would have to go there and labor for months knocking one toy Santa Claus after another off their shelf to get them to a place where they would really recognize that God, Jehovah, was Lord. Praise is a dynamic instrument of God. It is a chief instrument in the area of warfare. Please understand that it's not the loudness of your voice that pushes darkness back. It is light that pushes darkness back. And this is why praise. It's one of the chief ways that we can give back to God the light that we've received in our own spirits. Now, for necessity's sake and time's sake, I've got to move on to that second uh, unique uh, key to actualizing the anointing. Remember that praise was the first key. Look with me for the second in verse 4. In verse 4, the Scripture says, I sought the Lord. And he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. I sought the Lord. Mm. The word for seek there, or sought, is the word in the Hebrew, darash. Two words for seeking God, bakwash and darash. Darash, though, is not a general phrase for seeking him in prayer. It is a phrase for, for the, the actual meaning of I sought him to find him to love. I didn't ask him for a thing. I simply said, God, I want your presence. You don't separate it from the first key of praise. It's so interjoined with the first key of praise that the two, praise and prayer, are harmoniously linked together. How many of you remember when Jesus said, I shouldn't say Jesus, we'll, we'll encounter his saying the same thing though, when Isaiah, the prophet in the Old Testament, said that Father's house should be called a house of prayer. There in the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew word is tefillah. Tefillah. Tefillah literally means an oratoric judgment, uh, 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 an, an ability to oratorically express either in song or in word uh, something toward God or against the enemy. And it was beautiful to see it intoned in, in the Old Testament church and in the New Testament church. Do you remember that Jesus quoted Isaiah's verse in the temple when he said, it is written that Father's house should be called a house of prayer? There in the Canaan Greek, the word is prosueo. Listen to it carefully. Prosueo. Prose comes right into our language as poetry and prose. We get the sense in which there is meter and rhyme and rhythm and song. Uh, when the Jews prayed and praised, they did not separate the two. It went something like this. We lift your name, O God, we lift your name. We bless you from the deep of our heart. We lean on you this day, God. 
erect the standard against our enemy at the gates even this hour. God, move against them and, sus and sustain us, we pray, for we praise your name. Note with me, they would go from praise right into prayer, right back to praise. And that could, could take place hour after hour. Beloved, I, I believe with all of my heart that there's a day coming when God will so orient the church of Jesus Christ that we will be caught up in our worship and we'll spend hours sometimes praising the Lord and going right into intercessory prayer and judgment against the enemy and right back to praise. My heart longs for that day, and I honestly believe that day is even at hand. They were people that sought the Lord. Darash, to seek him, to find him, to love, and did so in prayer and praise. Note with me the third key to actualizing the anointing. The third key is found in verse 5. They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. The key of perception is that third key. When I think back in years of ministry in the Pacific Islands where my wife Florence and I served, I, I think not only of the delights of my life's mate, my companion, my wife, who is the dearest thing God ever gave me, and the years of service that she spent out there, her incredible ministry with me and the love that she has always shown for me. She has ministered not only in prayer and faithfully in intercession to me and for me, but has been my chief nurse in a myriad of conflicts. I am absolutely amazed at God's grace that's poured to my life through her. I can remember the myriad of trips that we took on the Ambassador II, the 54-foot-long uh, boat. Matter of fact, I'm going to portray that and picture that. Uh, for you, um, a ship that was purchased by young people from Southern California and aided us to reach the Marshall Islands. I think of the, the grass churches that we built and we started, 38 in number, and the peoples. I, I'm going to put that on the screen for you as well. I think of all that God did during those years, the times when we baptized uh, thousands of people uh, and, and had the, 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 the joint uh, grandeur of watching God move in the Marshall Islands. But in all of this, the major reason for God's move in that area of the world was that we learned early to get our eye on Him, not on events and things that were happening. Scripture tells us in verse 5, they looked unto Him. They did not get carried away with what was happening. They kept their eye on him. And their faces began to change, as we noted, to the, to the fact that they took on the appearance of the face of a lion. That is, their faces were set. They were men with a purpose. And God blessed them in an incredible and unusual way. Here was the key of perception. And may I urge you, do you honestly desire to actualize the anointing of God in your life, then learn, key number one, to praise God. Key number one, uh, number two, to seek His face. Key number three, to look unto Him and perceive that He is Lord of glory. And then in your perception of Him, He will save you from all your troubles. And that brings us to verse number 7 in the fourth and last key. 7 tells us this, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. This is the key of protection. David's men in the cave of Adullam needed to know to qualify for the kind of change that they thoroughly enjoyed that they were men who, when they marched, regardless of their boldness, would be men that would be protected. And so, too, God put that 
ponderously in their heart. I will be with you. This little phrase, the angel of the Lord, is Hebrew anthropomorphism. That is not an angel. That is the Spirit of God. And, and the way that the Hebrews chose to express with carefulness uh, something surrounding the awesomeness of God. So they called him the Spirit of the Lord. The angel of the, uh, the Lord was literally the Holy Spirit of God. And I, for one, thank God for that. I do not find any problem with the angels. We don't worship them. We don't turn and become carried away with, um, with stories on the angels. We recognize the fact that there are ministering angels today. But I am thankful to God that it's the Holy Spirit of God that gets in on our protection. One third of the angels in heaven fell when Satan fell. And, and I, for one, if it's all the same to you, do not want something batting 333 to get in on my protection. I want somebody that bats a thousand, if you please. And the Holy Spirit of God is that one that never fails. So it's the Spirit of God that encompasses us and delivers us. I want to close with this little story written by Kazantzakis in a book titled Report from Greco. You couldn't buy it in a bookstore today. You might find it in a library. It's probably 50 or 60 years old. Kazantzakis was a, a Greek writer of renown. He'd been trained on the island of Crete as a boy schooled through his high school years, and by the age of 21, had left the island of Crete and gone to Oxford University, received an outstanding education, and rather a renowned writing ability that had soon projected him into a place of, uh, of prominence. Somewhere in his early 40s, he determined that he wanted to return home to um, the island of Crete and revisit his old school chums. And so too, with a long boat trip, he arrived, got together with boys that he'd known from their childhood, and they laughed and talked of the joys of, of earlier years. Then he raised the question of their old Greek Orthodox priest, mentor, who had trained them from their childhood as their teacher. Where is that old mentor of ours, he said to his chums. And then he tried to recall his name. Blessed. Makarioi. Makarios. Yes, Makarios. Father Makarios. Where is he? They said, Cousin Zakas, he's still in the mountains. Would you like to see him? They said, yeah. He said, yes, I would. They packed their lunches and put on their backpacks and climbed slowly into the mountains and entering a mountain meadow, looked out ahead and here came Father Makarios as he traversed a little trail. The, uh, the writer, Cousin Zakas, placed himself in that trail to receive the old Greek Orthodox priest and then embraced him warmly and looked into his eyes and said to the old priest, uh, he said, Brother, are you still wrestling with the devil? And he said to uh, the old priest, Makarios looked at him and said, Cousin Zakas, I'm not wrestling with the devil. He's too old and too unimportant. He said, I shook my head. I looked at him and like a fool said, Father, with whom then do you, with whom then do you wrestle? He said, the old priest looked at me with gleaming eyes and said, Son, I wrestle with God. He said, like a fool, I made the next statement. Surely, surely, Makarios, you don't hope to win such a battle. He said, the old priest looked at me with eyes that blazed and said, you're right, son. I hope to lose such a battle. I thought on that and said, God, incredible. I'm writing a new book right now entitled Spiritual Warfare, How to Wrestle with God and Lose.
I know how that's done. I know how that's done. Listen to me now. Four keys that actualize the anointing. The first key, I will bless the Lord at all times. The key of praise. Magnify the Lord with me. The second key, the key of prayer. Verse 4, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me. The third key, the key of perception. They looked unto him, and their faces were lightened. Get your eye on Jesus. And the fourth key, the key of protection. The Spirit of God encompasses them round about. Until you really believe that, you'll never take a step to honor God in your call or in your life. These keys I have and I thank God for.